Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hi, okay, everyone. How are you going? Uh, Phil Tarrant here. Thanks for joining us on the Smart Property Investment Show today. I'm joined by Propertyology Head of Research and the Australian Real Estate Hall of Famer inductee, uh, Simon Presley. Simon, how are you going? Are you well? Very well, Phil. Still uh, working remotely from home, but um, it's the new norm, isn't it? It is new norm, and uh, I think everyone's talking about the new norm now. I think it's just the norm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like this is a great catalyst for change, and I was only chatting with a mate on the way up to work today saying, hey, look, you know, this is the COVID pandemic, but it's not the first or the last situation that we're all going to face and have to navigate and maneuver through. So I think uh, a lot of people have a lot more scar tissue as a result of this and hopefully start thinking more about planning for tomorrow rather than living for today. When you think of the consumerism that's taken place, everything is, I want it now, I'll get it now, and I'll think about the consequences and ramifications later, hence the reason why some people are under financial stress right now. So effective finance management is absolutely critical. And, you know, I've got young daughters, I teach them at home about this already. And I think there's skills that can uh, stick with you all through life. But property investing is uh, an interesting one. We're fortunate, we're privileged, Simon, as Australians, uh, to be able to invest in property. I think 8% of all Australians are somehow connected with an investment property per their tax returns. And uh, when you start getting into larger portfolios, the numbers get quite small. So property investors that do it well can typically navigate or weather all financial storms or health crises or whatever the pandemics there are. But a lot of that is not through um, chance or luck. A lot of it's down to good strategy. So I thought today, Simon, we can get into nine step sustainable investment strategy driven by you. And, um, you know, you've been working up this. So, you know, when we do get together on this podcast, we do like to do one to five or, or top 10 or, or 10 steps. So we've gone nine today, which is good. It's a nice memorable number. Is so nine I think a lucky it's number, is it, mate? I don't know. I know. It's a, I quite like number nine. Uh, it's not quite 10, but you know, I, I get explained as being a nine out of 10 sort of guy. So, you know, I'm never <laughs> perfect, but uh, <laughs> so we'll stick with nine, but um, it just gives us a bit of architecture to have a conversation around how property investors can be looking at their current portfolio, but planning for the future, you know, in preparation for the next time something happens. So let's start with number one, Simon, purpose. And this is, uh, I guess, the lifeblood of any decision making is why are you doing something, whether it's property investment or life in general? Why have you kicked off with number one, purpose? Yeah, I think, well, I agree. Investing is a form of goal setting, financial goals. And if we want to achieve anything important in life, it, it always starts with how, what is our why and how strong is it? For some of us, that comes naturally. They couldn't think of anything worse than, uh, you know, be uh, having to stay in the workforce until they die or having to exit the workforce, but not being able to afford much because the age pension and superannuation will, will never go very far. So it's really understanding what is your why. For some people, they never think of investing. And I always question them to consider, well, what would your life look like? Do you think if you never invested, you know, describe to me how your life would be when you're age 65, if you don't invest. And sometimes that's what people need to understand their purpose. Once we've got a really clear purpose, I think we then become more naturally driven to make more uh, responsible and more sophisticated financial decisions. I think a lot of people get caught up with the whole notion of purpose. They think it needs to be some big philanthropic idea or or something or other. I think when, when you're talking about property investment, purpose could be, can be really selfish, right? And your purpose could be simple as, well, I want to have enough money in retirement so I can do what I do right now. You know, that's okay. It's okay yeah. to be selfish in property investment, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll break it down. You know, I would, I would encourage everyone to just think about what stage in your life do you want to have the choice what you do when you jump out of bed in the morning? Now, for some people, that's, you know, I love what I'm doing and I can see myself doing this forever. You might feel that way now, but you won't necessarily always feel that way. So rather than retirement as in the traditional you know, sense, grey nomads or traveling the world or whatever, more pick a date or an age when you want to have the financial choice to do whatever you want. And then think about what sort of activities will you do? And in today's dollars, what would that cost from an annual income point of view? And from there, you can work backwards to see how big an asset base you need to fund that lifestyle. Yeah. And, you know, this is, I find with property investors, Simon, that um, they start investing and don't really know why, but at a point in time, there'll be some trigger point when they start realizing or being able to clarify or quantify exactly what their purpose is. So, on that basis, like, you know, do you need to rush into working out what this is or it's okay? Would you rather people get started for a purpose of being starting in property investment because it's the right thing to do and then really articulating what that key purpose is in time? It's okay to change yeah, your purpose or strategy. Yes, I think the lifestyle that we can 
foresee in the future. That often changes the older we get. So you don't need to lock in, you know, when you're age 30, for example, what you want to be doing in age 60. But I think what we do need at age 30 is an appreciation. And the most precious ingredient for every investor is completely free. It's time, but it's limited in supply. We've only got X number of years on the planet. Yeah. So I guess, Simon, that lends itself a lot to this whole notion of a mindset, you know, how an adaptable mindset, a mindset that is fluid but also driven can help ensure that you keep aligned to this purpose but be transitional enough to move with the times, particularly when you get an issue like COVID-19. Mindset is critically important, Phil, and especially for property investors. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of property investors don't have the best investment mindset. And that's the reason for that is because property is tangible, it's bricks and mortar, and too many emotional decisions get made with property. We really, to make the best possible decisions, we need to try our best to stop seeing the bricks and the mortar and the town and the city and think more like a share investor. The asset they're investing in is a financial instrument. You know, how it looks is not greatly important. Mindset's also part of acknowledging confirmation bias. A property market's not like a footy team. You know, barracking it up or down is not going to influence whatsoever. We need the ability to think objectively and understand what drives things. Remove emotion, as I said. Being careful of not just following what the consensus say is part of mindset. If the consensus were more often than not right, Australia would be full of millionaires. And of course, we know there are very, very few people who are financially independent. Often the contrarian view is more often than right than whatever the consensus view is at each and every time. So as a property investor, the effective property investor, you see they've had this sort of emotional detachment to what the asset class is. They understand it is just a financial instrument. It's largely irrelevant in performance, what it looks like. Yeah, as long as it's, um, when I'm helping someone invest, the, the aesthetics of it, as long as it's not offensive, you know, that's important from how it looks and touches. But but some things can be easily, uh, you know, touched up with not a lot of capital to paint a room or to replace some floor coverings or some tiles or, you know, things like that. But the town or the city that the property's in will always have the biggest influence. Now, that's got nothing to do with bricks and mortar. You know, the asset needs to be structurally sound. It needs to be low maintenance so that, you know, as the investor, you're not forever forking out money repairing stuff all the time. But just because it might look nice, it doesn't mean it's low maintenance. And conversely, it might look pretty bland, pretty vanilla, but it might actually cost very little from an upkeep point Mm. of view. Yeah. So I guess that's, you know, every property in every location has a a particular role to play. And some people with larger portfolios, that becomes a lot more relevant. But, you know, nine step sustainable investment strategy, the third point here is diversification. So I guess that lends itself to that logic. Yeah. Diversification is one of the most important of the nine steps and one of the least respected ones, I think. It's investment 101. You know, if you think of what a share investor would do, for example, with a, say, a $200,000 share portfolio, They would spread that across multiple stocks and in multiple companies on the stock exchange. But unfortunately, a lot of property investors, they will buy their investment property in the same town or city that they live in. That's not diversification at all. It's the complete opposite, isn't it? If we've got a family home, I live in Brisbane. So if I buy, uh, you know, my first investment property in Brisbane as well, I've got all my eggs in the one basket. So with diversification, Simon, is this largely around where the asset is based or where the property is based or is it the type of assets that you have? I think it's a couple of things, Phil. It's certainly uh, having appreciation for where you live and where you invest are completely different decisions. So understanding that local economies arguably have the biggest influence on how a property market will perform and no one has the crystal ball. So if anything, where you live, you should be considering investing in, I think, and this is what I do personally, you should be considering investing in locations other than where you live. Again, it's like the person who might work for Commonwealth Bank. It doesn't mean all their shares are with Commonwealth Bank. Mm. But it's also breaking up your capital into smaller chunks. Again, I'm deliberately using the example of what a share investor would do. If they had $10,000 or $100,000, they will put it in multiple companies. And just because a property investor might be able to afford an $800,000 asset or a million dollar asset, I would argue it's not the best that you could do with that money to put it into one property. You know, I typically will buy property somewhere between, I bought a couple under 300,000, but usually they're between 300 and 500,000. So if I'm going to afford a million dollars, that's great, but I won't buy one property for a million dollars. The cash flow from that expensive property will be a bigger drain on the household budget. But also when something comes from left field in that particular market, my entire million dollars is exposed to that. 
Whereas if I had been smarter initially and broken the capital up into smaller chunks in different parts of the country, if there is an unexpected adverse event, it might affect one of my properties, but not the entire portfolio. I guess a big part, and to touch on it, that you spoke there, Simon, a big component of diversification is sort of cash flow versus investment capital, two very, very different things. And and that's going to be point four on nine steps sustainable investment strategy, part of diversification, but a unique component in itself. Yeah, I think some people get confused, especially with the capital part of it. I think cash flow is self-explanatory, but the capital part of it, one of the most common ways that people invest in property, Phil, is in an earlier stage of their life, they probably bought the family home. And then over the years, they acquire equity in that family home. And at a later date, they borrow against that equity in the family home to invest. Very common strategy, nothing wrong with that strategy at all. But there is a difference between what type of capital is it? Is it capital we're raising against the equity in an existing asset? Or is it capital that's in the form of cashed savings, accumulated savings? And how we use that capital, whether our capital is coming from borrowed money or whether it's coming from saved cash, or have an effect on our annual cash flow. We do a lot of financial modelling for our clients. So let's say, for example, someone does have $200,000. We're interested in, is that $200,000 cash? Or is it $200,000 equity that you're releasing in an existing asset? And then how can we break that up? Not putting that 200 grand in the one asset, as I said, and using different combinations of loan to value ratios will have a different impact on the cash flow But it's also a very clever way of using numbers and often it can mean that you could buy two or sometimes three properties instead of the one property. Is it almost something that investors, when they start investing so on from your experience, go in with this logic and these notions around sort of capital growth versus cash flow? Would you say it's a fundamental understanding most property investors have or is something that typically they realise in time when they work out their cash position isn't great? Yeah. Look, I personally think that capital growth and cash flow are both important, mm. um, but sometimes we come across clients who feel that the reason for picking an individual location or an individual property is because they want to get the highest cash flow possible, confusing their purpose that we were talking about right at the, you know point number one, confusing their purpose down the track wanting to have a cash flow to enable them to exit the workforce. But if you pick a property today to invest in because it has a bit better cash flow than something else, there'll often be a really good reason why it's got a significantly better cash flow. And whatever that individual reason is, it will probably be the reason why it doesn't appreciate much from a capital growth perspective. So my view is the primary reason for picking where you invest is for its capital growth potential. I mean, no one can tell anyone how much it will grow by, but that's what I base my decision on is it's for its capital growth potential. And then I also respect the cash flow because it's the cash flow that can get people into trouble. Mm. Uh, right now, for example, with the coronavirus, a lot of household incomes have been adversely affected. And there'll be some investors through no real fault of their own, you know, their income is reduced, but now their investment property is causing them a lot of stress perhaps at the time of buying the property, they might have been able to afford the ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year that they needed to put in of their own money to prop that investment up. But if something happens to that income, it becomes a real drain. So we need to respect the cash flow. And the primary reason for picking where to invest is the capital growth potential. I, in my opinion. Yeah, look, you know, I invest for for capital growth potential and, and ensure that the cash flow situation is managed. And there's a whole bunch of ways you can do that. And, you know, environments like coronavirus or COVID-19 and the impact, which for many people is that completely, well, for everyone is out of their control what's happened. Yeah. You know, we'll get into risk mitigation at the point in time. But point number five, Simon, of the nine step sustainable investment strategy. Again, this is a, a component of this is diversification. That's debt structuring how you secure financing, the features of those particular financing, but the structure of how you hold those assets as well. A very, very important part of a property investor's overall portfolio is structuring of debts. And that has very little to do with interest rates. I think for a lot of property investors, that's probably the only question they ask themselves when they're arranging a loan is, uh, is what is the rate? Mm. Um, that, that's a moving target. The cheapest loan today won't be the cheapest loan next month, but it's not sustainable to keep refinancing our loan. So, I'm fortunate I've got a banking background in a former life. And as much as an investor, whilst we're focusing on the asset side of our balance sheet, we should pay just as much respect to the liability side of our balance sheet. So debt structuring includes things like not having all your loans with the one lender. Again, in a former life working for a bank, 
I've got an appreciation for the power of banks and the control that banks like to have. So simply never give them that control. As the property investor, keep yourself in control of your own destiny by having multiple lenders that provide your liabilities as your portfolio grows. Understand the difference between a good debt and a bad debt. So a good debt is a debt where the purpose of the loan was to acquire an income producing asset and it therefore becomes a tax deductible asset. And there's some really good strategies that we can help people use to drive down bad debt or non-deductible debt. Uh, Contingency funds is part of uh, debt structuring as well. Sometimes the role of an offset account when used properly inside a portfolio can just mean your money's working harder rather than the individual investors working harder. And also um, debt structuring plays a role in how you manage your investment cash flows. There's lots of things to consider there. Yeah, it is. And you know, a lot of those points that Simon just touched on, they might be quite complicated. Go and check out smartproductinvestment.com when we look at all those things, including you know, offsets and redraws. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of offset accounts, um, you know, getting your money work hard for you. And, and I definitely use offsets accounts as where I keep sort of cash tied up. So um, I'm offsetting the, the interest on a mortgage. And I guess with debt structuring as well, it can get a lot more complicated depending on how you hold these assets. So I mean, if you hold them in your individual names versus in a company name or within a trust, you know, there is layers upon layers of complexity, which can therefore change your debt makeup or debt mix. You know, investing in trust, for example, often it can be harder securing a mortgage. Sometimes you pay a little bit more in terms of interest rates, but that's normally offset by other risk minimization components of it as well. So a lot of that, you're going to need some good financial advice around. I highly recommend sort of speaking with your account when it comes to how you structure your investments. Point number six, Simon, on the nine step sustainable investment strategy market drivers. This is what everyone always talks about, what's driving markets. And it's typically where most of our conversations end up when we get on the Smart Property Investment um, Show. I guess it's probably the most sexy part of investing, the the thing that people are most interested in, but it's also the most complex. Mm. It's impossible for everybody to know everything or to become an, an expert in market research unless you're doing that for a living. But there's some basic things that I think every investor should know. Yeah, to me, they include things like understanding that every individual town or city has a property cycle and what we call a growth cycle, so a period of years where property markets are performing strongly. History's taught us that they generally only come around once every 10 to 15 years. They don't happen very often mm. and they usually only last somewhere between two to four years. They don't last very long. So, Some basic things that I encourage every investor to be aware of is market cycles. Understand the role that a local economy has in a property market. And if there's one thing you want to take an interest in if you do like research, it's to understand what are the main industries that drive each individual town and city's economy and what are the decisions that are happening today that's going to have an influence within those industries in the coming couple of years. That's always the gold information. We certainly focus more on that than anything else. Understand that the behaviour of the existing population, that's the 99% of people that are living in a town or city today, their behaviour will always have a much bigger influence than the 1% population growth in the next year. We've spoken before about population behaviour is more important than population growth. And also residential construction. Too many cranes can be a growth suppressant if behind all those cranes is more future supply than what the local population requires. Yeah. And look, we've just covered that really quickly, Simon, but uh, we've spoken at length about this the last number of podcasts we've done together. So I highly encourage you to go and listen to them. We dig right down deeply into those those scenarios and those types of issues and market dynamics. So, you know, market drivers is key and it's a big focus for everyone. But um, thanks for sharing that just then, Simon. Risk mitigation, where you sit on the risk Spectrum is individual to everyone. It's like our own DNA or fingerprint, right? It's not the same for everyone or not the same for anyone. Where where do you sit, Simon, in terms of if someone said to you, are you a risky investor or I imagine you're not? I reckon everything you do has definitely got a reason behind it. Yeah, you're right. I think it's part of each person's personality. Um, Mm. Yeah, I'm a conservative when it comes to risk mitigation. It's important to me for any big decision I'm going to make in life, whether it's financial or business or whatever, it's in my nature to first try to work out what are all the things that could go wrong. And then I go through a structured process to, I guess, individually work out, well, what could I do if some of these what ifs happened? Mm. But then once I feel comfortable that I could, to the best of my ability, 
mitigate the various circumstances that could happen in the future, then I'm 100 miles an hour sort of guy. Because to me, I've, you know, I can put the head in the pillow at night knowing that the unexpected will probably happen at some stage. But I've thought beforehand what I could do in such a situation. Yeah, I'm very similar. I'm always thinking sort of seven, eight steps down the path and all the what ifs. And, you know, as normally when I'm walking or doing something or swimming, I, I sort of muse over all those sort of stuff. So that's how I go through. That's my own internal narrative. I don't sit in front of a computer and try and force myself to have those thoughts and go through that process. It's more of an organic thing for me. But, you know, I think as an individual, you all need to have your own way of understanding where the challenges may lay and, and working out how you navigate through them. In terms of risk mitigation, what would be the sort of headlines that you want to cover for property investors, Simon? Yeah, and often it's, I think it's good we're talking about this topic today because there will be some people who uh, perhaps have a high appetite to risk that made some decisions in years gone by and whether, you know, she'll be right, nothing could go wrong, I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof and mm. now might be, you know, experiencing some kind of adversity. So some basic risk mitigation strategies include investing in affordable assets as opposed to expensive assets. We mentioned before not having all your eggs in the one basket, you know, don't have all your properties in the one town or city or the one state. Investing in what I call meat and potato properties as opposed to niche properties. It, you know, the risk increases if you go from, say, residential to commercial. I'm not saying there isn't opportunities in those, but talking about risk mitigation, we need to understand that certain things have more risk than others. Don't confuse property development with property investing. I'm not an anti-property developer, but understand that that is not investing. That is a business transaction with an even greater range of variables and often things that are largely out of the individual investor's control. So, you know, don't jump into that path without being, you know, really well educated. Stress test things like your cash flows before you make any financial decision. I do budgets, for example, based on receiving my rent for 48 weeks out of 52 in a year. I factor in, even though I might have a loan on an interest-only structure, I factor in what will be the principal and interest repayment, you know, and can I afford that? Even though a bank will do that, the bank's not paying the loan back. I'm paying the loan back. So yeah, I'll make sure I can do that. I think it's good to have a contingency fund for the unexpected, whether it's an unexpected to the own individual's income or whether it's an unexpected major capital expenditure item to a property. You know, I need a new stove or a new hot water system. My general rule of thumb there, if you've got access at any given time to $5,000 per property in your portfolio, I think that that's being responsible. Yeah, it's pretty reasonable. You should be able to cover most most sort of sundry costs or immediate costs based on 5K. Yeah, and now's a good example with the impact that COVID's having on some rents, for example. You know, mm. no one would have expected the coronavirus this time 12 months ago, but unfortunately, some people have taken a bit of a haircut on their rents. If their investment strategy already had some buffers and some contingencies in there, they're in a situation today that whilst they don't like the rent that they're currently receiving, they're not in a distressed situation that they have to bail out of an asset at the worst time to sell in a particular market. I guess the closing point, Simon, I make around risk mitigation is that you can't outsource risk mitigation to other people. I think you can lean on people for the right advice to help you shape your investment strategy structure, you know, so it can be as risk averse as possible, but you can't fundamentally outsource the responsibility risk. It all comes up to the property investor. And if you want to go down that path, you shouldn't be investing in property. Yeah, uh, that's right. Each individual investor, you have to be accountable. The buck stops with you. Mm. Your, everything is your decision at the end of the day. No one's got a crystal ball. By all means, you know, engage expertise where you can because they'll have more experience in the various fields than you will. But all they can do is make recommendations and give advice. The individual mm. investor must be accountable. Yeah, you've got to step up. And I guess that's always to do with point number eight of our nine-step sustainable investment strategy, and that is reviewing your situation, your position, your portfolio. How often? All the time? Yeah, all the time. I mean, as an absolute minimum, each and every time when you think you're ready to invest, as a minimum, before you jump into that next big decision, review what you've already got. Mm. Even if it's the first investment property that you're about to embark on, you can still review things that we've already discussed. You know, have I got my debt structures, you know, set up properly? Have I got risk mitigation strategies in place? If you already have investments, then for some people, the only time they ever review the existing investments is in preparation for repeating the process in the next investment. I enjoy, you know, um, having those sort of discussions with clients, talking about the outlook for where their existing properties are, but also reviewing things like the cash flows on certain assets. There can be some people who have a property in a market that might not necessarily have a bad outlook, 
but it might be the wrong asset type. Loans might be set up poorly. They might be in the wrong names. Cash flows might be holding their overall strategy back. So get some really good advice you know, around the review piece. So nine-step sustainable investment strategy, number one, purpose, number two, mindset, number three, diversification, number four, Simon, investment capital versus cash flow, number five, debt structuring, number six, market drivers, number seven, mismitigation, eight, review, all really good fundamental structural stuff. And if I was listening to this, I'd be writing them down and, and using that as a portfolio review just to stress test where you're going right now if you're thinking of investing. But point number nine, and we touched on it as part of the risk mitigation, is expertise. You don't need necessarily do all this alone, do you? No, and I'd like to think that Australians have progressively got better as a society. And I think technology is probably part of that. There's a greater appreciation that not all Australians have, but a bigger segment of society today understand that there are experts for most things. It's impossible to know what you don't know. No one can do everything, you know, full time, but there will probably be a profession out there somewhere that that's their core business. So, you know, someone who does something for a living, they've got all those experiences from different years and from different clients that individual person can leverage off. Mortgage broking is a good example. You know, 20 years ago, we'd probably heard of the term, but not many people had used mortgage brokers. And then people of in more recent years, people are, are all aware of mortgage brokers, but they also understand that there are some really good strategic mortgage brokers and some, you know, average run of the mill mortgage brokers. Buyers agents, people have become more aware of buyers agents. People have become aware market research is a lot more to it than what they realize. Law, there are those who specialize in property law and there's those who specialize in general law. So seek out expertise. I certainly do it myself i'm not a you know my expertise is in market research and buyers agency that's important but it's not everything so things that i don't specialize in i I get expertise i look for people who have formal qualifications for people who walk the walk they do it themselves i respect people who have some scar tissue i've got plenty pain is sometimes a great learner because we don't Mm. like pain so if we've experienced it before it tends to sharpen our focus and set us on a bit of a mission to avoid experiencing that pain again that's called experience isn't it Oh, it is. Absolutely. And I think uh, everyone's going through COVID-19 right now. So, uh, you know, for those who are sort of under financial stress and struggling, I'd be reaching out to expertise right now to to see how you can maneuver or navigate as a property investor to try and avoid having to sell your property. You know, if you're selling property as a property investor, you want to do it very strategically, not in response to outside forces. So uh, go and ask for the expertise right now. But I think we all should be better property investors as a result of COVID-19. It's, it's probably changed and shaped the way in which a lot of us are going to think about property moving forward and how we can prepare ourselves, whether it's mentally or financially or our portfolios for what is the next big disruption. And when that happens, who knows, Simon? You know, the last big sort of hurdle was the GFC, and that's a good sort of 10 years ago. So here we are in 2020 in the middle of COVID-19. And I'm sort of reading some stories coming out in some, let's just call it media that isn't particularly uh, positive about property at any given time right now. And they're talking about this sort of downturn of 40 to 50% in Australian property. There's a couple of people who have been claiming that's going to happen for the last 20 years. So they're back in the uh, the market saying the same thing. So while I've got you, Simon, let's put a bit of sensibility around this. It's probably going to drop 50% in the coming period? I might, if it's going to drop anywhere near 50%, we might as well all pack up our bags and, and go home. Our life is over. No way. I do think there'll be some casuals come, at, come out of this, but when I say casualties, some mild price declines in some, but certainly nowhere near all markets. And it's not like it's going to be you know massive declines that will last many, many years. I, I don't see that. In fact, history has taught us that not just in Australia, but worldwide, out of crisis, there's often enormous opportunities. People underestimate human spirit. And a lot of the commentary, you know, whether it's the coronavirus or the GFC, when you're in the moment, a lot of the commentary actually makes me angry, Phil, because it shows up the negative Nancys or the, I call them the lemon suckers. They just mm-hmm. always got something sour yeah. to find. But they underestimate the power of human spirit. Most of us have got a competitive instinct in us. We don't like losing. We don't like having things taken away from us. And that's why whether it's World War I, World War II, Spanish flu, Australia's last recession, GFC, coronavirus, we dig in and we look for a way to overcome whatever's been taken away from us. That'll happen now. Another thing I like out of a crisis, not that we want these things to happen, but it's an awesome learning opportunity. Yeah. You know, I am excited to think of in a few years from now what I might have learned 
as a property market analyst and a buyer's agent from the coronavirus. We learned some things from the GFC. We learned some things from mining booms and mining downturns that we wouldn't have known without those events. And we're going to learn some really valuable things out of the coronavirus as well. Well, and, you know, the best investors I know are reactive and responsive to that. And, you know, you've got to get over the fact that there's a lot of things you can't control right now. And you might find yourself in a position that you're not necessarily happy about, but, you know, you can't lament on the reasons why you're there. What you can do is take control of what the future looks like for you. So that's, I think, the spirit of all good property investors and, and stick with it, stay in the game. And Simon, we're fortunate that we've got people like you in the market who give a sense of sensibility and, and accountability, but also um, perspective at times like this. And, you know, as an asset class property, since the very first people landed in the rocks there and circular key way back when to where it is today, you just see, look at those upward curves, that property does perform well over time. Yes, it goes up or down. This might be one of those periods where it goes down a little bit. But let's remember our banks are strong. Our banks globally are, are well regarded and uh, our banks don't want to see uh, reductions of 40 to 50% in property prices. I'll tell you that for nothing. Yeah. And as we discussed a bit last time, I think, Phil, yeah, you know, we shouldn't underestimate what have we invested in as a property investor. We're investing in shelter. A virus, a germ, it doesn't mean we need less shelter, does it? We would always need shelter. Over the last two years, everyone should be reminding themselves that building approval volumes, which is the leading indicator for new dwelling supply has been increasingly getting lower and lower and lower. Mm. Um, We are fortunate that the coronavirus hit at a time when supply is low. If it hit uh, in, say, 2017 at the peak of a construction boom, we probably would have seen a significant downturn in property prices. But fortunately for this country, it's hit us at a time when housing supply in large parts of Australia is low. And if, if anything, the coronavirus will have an adverse impact on the construction sector and keep supply low for quite some time. And we've got the record low interest rate. So even those who have properties at the moment and have mortgages, they're fortunate that the minimum mortgage repayment is much, much lower than what it would have been this time 12 months ago. I think we've had, what, five interest rate cuts over it's last? Been a lot. It's been a lot of yeah. drops. And, you know, and getting back to like what the media has been saying, you know, it always tries to benchmark Australia with the rest of the world where sort of, you know, household debt levels to value of properties sort of like three or four, whereas we're up at like nine and 10, et cetera. So we get compared a lot with the rest of the world, but in many ways, Australia is unique. And I think as we navigate COVID and, and as we start coming out the other side, having fared reasonably well and hats off to the government and, and health professionals to, to steer us through that, this market's only going to become more and more attractive. I can understand why more people want to come and make Australia home. It's a great place to live. Yes, I agree with that. Um, once um, international borders open up, I think already, Phil, um, Australia's been put up on a pedestal globally, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Australia and New Zealand have been put on a pedestal about how well we've dealt with this. Part of it's uh, not our own doing. Part of it's the fact that we're uh, you know, big island countries. Yes. Uh, but there will be people very envious of, of us uh, living in parts of um, you know, Europe and America, sort of going, I wish I was living over in, you know, in Australia or New Zealand. We've always been a big nation for immigration. Whilst we probably won't have any immigration at all for the next year or so, who knows? You know, part of our um, political policies, once the borders open, might be to let's ramp up immigration. What's that going to do for housing demand? What's that yeah. going to do for extra tax revenue for our economy? So it's easy to draw to be drawn to the negative that's going on at the moment, but it won't always be this way. That's why we're both glass half full people, Simon. Absolutely. I'll close with that out, but uh, thanks for your time. Simon Presley, Propiology Head of Research. Always enjoy it. Thanks for joining us today, Simon. Good on you, Phil. Talk next time. Nice one. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Social media, uh, if that's how you like to get your info, just search Smart Property HQ. And please keep those reviews coming on iTunes and wherever platform you're listening to this particular podcast. The guys and girls get a real kick out of it here. The engine behind these podcasts, just not me behind a microphone, but a real talented team that love creating these shows so you can be more informed. We'll be back again next time. Till then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.